With nearly 12,000 tools available, selecting the right MarTech can be challenging. Meet the MarTech Intelligence Reports, free buyer's guides exploring specific platforms, including purchase considerations, leading players, adoption trends, and more. No matter where you are in the purchase journey, MarTech Intelligence Reports can help. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining the session today. Uh, I hope we're going to keep this very light and fun. A little bit hard to do because this is a pre-recorded session, but we're going to make it as fun as possible. Um, what I want to do is uh, I want to give you a peek behind the curtain of automation and how AI plays in with automation. There's a couple of pieces that we'll set the stage on. We will talk about automation in general, its, its use cases and why it's valuable. Um, and then we're going to get into the, the AI world and something that I've been calling intelligent automation, AI-informed automation. So we're going to cover this today. Uh, we, we all know that AI is blazingly hot right now. It's everywhere we look. And um, we want to talk about why it's become critical for business success. There are reasons that we automate. There are reasons that we bring in AI. There have been some barriers in the past to automation and automation success. We want to be able to explore those Talk about the journey it's going to take. It's going to take you to go through and have some fun with automation and get that, reap that benefit as we go. Finally, of the three things that we're going to talk about topic wise, we're going to talk about how to combine AI with automation and maximize the use of both technologies. When we, we look at this together, we've, we've actually spent a lot of time in automation. So, um, automation for the last many years, I mean, go way back into you know, into the industrial era, era, automation has been part of that. Um, but AI is a new piece. And as we bring AI in, we see that its value really is an informer to, to automation. And then finally, we're going to close with some practical use cases that you can apply. Things that we've used automation for and things that we've used uh, AI for to make this a, a better experience and show that value and show why it's important that we do that, why we use those two things together. So a little bit about me. First of all, I I hate this picture. I hate every picture, though, so we can forget about that. I have been in advertising and automation for about 20 years now. So I've written software. I'm a software developer at heart. Um, I spent 10 years building ad tech at a, at a previous company that was all built around automation. One of the reasons that I got into this space, and I'll just kind of tell this backstory from way back then, was... I had good friends in, in my last company that were in the ad operations, uh, ad operations team. In that team, I would notice that Friday, every Friday, Friday after Friday after Friday, one of my very close friends would be there as the lights shut off late into the day. And I would go over and I'd talk with him. And, and what he'd get is he'd get a, a really complex client request late on a Friday that needed to be executed over the weekend. It needed to be ready from Monday morning, and it would ruin his weekend. And I became really passionate about solving that problem for him, so much so that I picked up my desk out of engineering, I moved it over into ad operations, and I spent the, almost the rest of my career in that, you know, in that space, immersed with the team, doing the job alongside them, finding those pain points, and trying to close them out. Um, in that, I am a, a, you know, a, a, now a new advocate for AI, AI coming out in, say, December, I mean, becoming very strong in December of last year. I've uh, gotten to explore that quite a bit, really enjoyed it, doing it. Since my last company, um, we went and started started a company. I, I'm a co-founder of an ad tech platform, an ad tech company called Fluency, which I'll introduce now. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about Fluency. Fluency is a company that we started in 2017. Uh, it was at the end of our, our last journey. Uh, it's a company focused all around ad automation and trying to re cover and recoup the scalability that you can get from, from auto automation and re recoup that margin uh, erosion that we find in our businesses. Your clients are always asking you, what do I pay you for? 
why do I spend 20% or whatever the margin profile is? They're always trying to pull that down and, and, and make that smaller and smaller. Meanwhile, the job gets harder and harder all the time. So there's a lot of lost time that is well suited for, for automation. Anytime I try to describe what fluency is, I think about this analogy that I, I came up with, which is you can dig any hole with a shovel or you can dig those same holes with an excavator. We think of fluency as the excavator, where you can move more earth with less sweat and less labor, and it becomes a, a great efficiency play. It returns that margin back to your, to your business. So as you can see here, we're integrated across many networks. Uh, we're an Inc. 5000 um, fastest growing company for this year, number 200 on the list, very proud of that. It's been a great journey to, to start fluency. At fluency, as you saw in that last slide, just a little note on the bottom, I'm one of our co-founders and our president. And I'm surrounded by three other founders that have been amazing and an enormous team that is only growing and, and just incredible. So if the last couple of slides don't already answer this question, we're going to answer it over the next few slides. Um, why do we need to intelligently automate? It should be clear that the job just keeps getting more and more complex. Your, your ad operations team is overloaded today and it just gets worse. There is an anecdote that I have. As I was leaving my last company, I was looking for a new opportunity, a new place to explore. And this is before we'd made the decision to start Fluency. I'd interviewed with an audience company. At that audience company, I spent an entire day in that interview. I loved it. I heard great stories. I saw what they were able to do with their data. I believed in what they had. And just as I was about to sign to start working with them, I got this little bit of anxiety. And I thought about pretty much this visual right here. And I asked the, the CEO of the company, I said, how, I said, you, you've done this for a lot of different companies, haven't you? And they said, yes, we have. And I said, and when you bring it to the ad operations team to say, you should use these audiences, how many times does it actually happen? He's like, oh, it never happens. It's so frustrating. And I said, I understand why. You only have so much time in the day. You have huge client workloads. You have a lot of demands on your time. And it's just yet another thing. No matter how good the idea is, it's just yet another thing. So we wanted to make, so I, I said to him, I, I wasn't going to sign with the audience company. I was going to go start my own company because I wanted to solve that problem, that specific problem. I wanted to make it so that we could do more. All those best practices, none of us are unaware of them. They're just hard to find the time to actually do them all. The alternative is that you can you have to hire more people. And if you hire more people, that obviously erodes your margin or increases cost to your clients. And that trade-off is a very challenging thing to do. So with Fluency, we spent our time working on an automation system, a system that could take your strategy, the way that you want to actually execute, and make it so you could be super powered from a central seat. And I think all automation platforms fall into this same kind of category. So I just want to talk about the philosophy that we have here. Automation is meant to not look like, I mentioned the industrial revolution. And if you think about the, the production lines, it's not meant to look like a production line. It's meant to automate your decision-making. So with this, if you understand the decision points that you make and the ways that you would go left or right based on certain input data, we want to help automate that for you. We want to remove those manual button clicks and the continual requirement to make that left or right turn every time you have to make a choice. So I love this visual. It's a cool graphic, little marionette, your strategy, controlling lots of little robots out there, um, doing, doing the, the job for you, helping you become more predictable, more consistent. And that gives you that scalability. That returns margin back to your business. So if right now, if you're, I mean, it's pretty typical, an ad strategist, manually can handle maybe 30 accounts as their workload, 30 to 35 accounts. We, we hear about that all the time. With automation, that number can go way up. We ha we've had people in the 300 accounts per, per strategist because the tedium is not there and they work more in the long tail and in that super, super last mile refinement. Lastly, the last bullet here, and, I, and we are going to talk a lot about AI as we go through this. We want to talk about how AI can amplify and improve your team's lives. I think we've seen some of that. We, everybody's a little uncomfortable letting taking their hand completely off the wheel, but if you've ever been in a Tesla self-driving car or like automated driving car, as long as you keep your hand on the wheel a little bit, it does a lot for you. And it's really a, a it's just a great experience to be in. Why does, well, where does this all come together? It all comes together here. It all comes together in savings. So 
there are many places that you can automate within your ad operations. These are some four on the left-hand side are, are things that we've seen really huge savings in. Account launch can go down by 90% at the times that you, time you invest in, in account launch. Report creation, 90%. Campaign optimizations, and this is again where, where you end up doing the long tail and the client request customizations, 71% there and 97% on budget management pacing. Budget management pacing is a phenomenal place because it's it's really just numbers and it's just math. These numbers are obviously like, I, I can't guarantee that these are global numbers. What I can say is from the accounts that we have seen, that we've been exposed to, these are the averages that we get with our clients. And what that really results in is somewhere in that Foursquare or one of the other places that we can automate, every organization we've ever worked with has found some place to expand margin. Really, in, in our businesses, the cost of labor is, is pr pretty much the driving cost. It's the cost of my businesses. I'm sure it's the cost of most of your businesses. Um, and if we can be efficient with that labor, not remove it, but do more with less sweat, that's a great spot for us to be. It also leaves us in a place where rather than tedium, rather than you know, copy and paste and constant navigation through tools, we're more in that high cognition work. We're in this places where we can go and, and be more advisors to our clients grow those ad portfolios. And we have seen that over time too, is that you can grow your ad portfolios more when you're not in the tedium of just straight execution. It's definitely a journey to, to, to take advantage of automation. And we'll go through that. I, I won't say that there is no effort, it's, but it's a fun journey to go on. You can. It's more fun to take a journey with a partner. And let's talk about what, what are those things that may be in our way today or may have, have traditionally been in our way and how we can get through those things. One of the most important things that I have seen for anybody is to understand their internal best practices. If you don't understand your internal best practices, it's very hard to base to automate those decision points that you make. If that, that thing that we talked about go about going left or right based on a decision, usually that's something driven by an inventory level or a price change or a you know, societal change, it may be something in the news that makes you say that I want to really focus on I don't, interest rates dropped. I want to talk about, uh, you know, our mortgage rates or our, our financing rates right now. Um, with that understanding, your best practices and what you have is your secret sauce and your and your competitive differentiation, super important. And if you can do that, you can start the journey to automation. A lot of times people are very concerned about brand and co-op compliance. We, we have a lot of clients in automotive and in real estate, and in multifamily housing. Three, three industries that I know very well have a lot of compliance rules. Automotive have brand, have, has brand compliance rules, and there's the Fair Housing Act with, um, with the real estate and, and multifamily housing sector. And we want to be conscious of that. So when you do automation, you don't want that to go awry because you will pay fines. Messaging and campaign strategy is always something that needs to feel human. And that can be challenging if you're letting a robot do that. Uh, you want to make sure that you you have differentiation in your agency. So whatever, if we go back to that story about industrial revolution and, and, and product li uh, factory lines, we don't want it to feel like it's a cookie cutter solution. We don't. We want it to be relevant to the accounts that we're operating on, relevant to the situations that they experience, their unique product sets. So you, and to the philosophy of the agency. So as an example, we talked about automotive. It could be an example that I'm very passionate that I need to use audiences in, in paid search as a bid multiplier to talk about make model trim level uh, conversations. It may not be the way someone else in automotive would do it. So having your understanding of what you think your unique value prop is, your unique data, all those things that make you different, super important. And, and we, you, want, you want to make sure that that flows well into your automation solutions. This has been a, a longstanding problem with experimentation and customization. Once you have something in the machine, how do you get it out of the machine? How do you take it offline so that you can learn something new and then make, make the automation better as you go forward? So you want, a, you want a solution that can can solve for that. And then finally, data hygiene. All this stuff is powered from, from the data that's relevant to your accounts and your business information. So that business data is the, is the core and the heart of all of your automation. And a lot of times that data can be, you know, can be um, non-standard or, or clumsy to, to work with. So with an RPA solution or an AI powered solution, you can solve all these problems. 
You can model your best practices. That's a, that's the sign of a good RPA platform. You can ensure and put governance around brand compliance. This is a really important thing, and, I, and we will get into that a little bit more as we go. But having rule systems that will get, allow you to ensure brand compliance and, and that your automation will stay brand compliant, super important. Um, for your content, this is where AI has really shown great promise over the last year. You could generate content libraries and use those in situations. When what we talked about the scenario about using uh, finance rates uh, when, the, when the interest rates go up or down. So we can talk about that. And we might have a library of messaging that we know is compliant and that we like the way it sounds. With AI, we can greatly expand that variation. We can make it continue to feel natural. We can do put some governance around it and make sure that it stays compliant and it stays stays in the guardrails. Agency differentiation when we when you know what your value prop is and you're not stuck in the tedium of daily management, you can really do that white glove delivery. With that, you can go and you can ensure that your customers are, are well serviced. You can talk to them more. You can express how you do something different than anybody else better, and you can get into that long tail customization, which is which is really important. I think any RPA that doesn't allow for you to learn at scale is a miss. And so look for an RPA solution that gives you the ability to, to take some things off the main trunk of automation and, and do experimentation. And so we have this, this concept called blueprints and fluency, but it's, you, you can do it several different ways if you wanted to. Uh, with blueprints, you could take segments of accounts off, experiment with new data, um, new strategies, new inputs, and see how they, they respond. And, and we have a couple of examples of that in, in future slides. And in the data hygiene, I know the level of effort that we've taken over time, it's, it's been exhausting, um, to try to normalize everybody's data. We have seen great promise with what AI can do as far as data normalization, as long as you give it some good guidelines, some good feeder inputs. We have spent the time, over time, to do it without AI because it, it's relatively new, but with AI, it gets better and better. So your data hygiene, you can get it normalized, you can get it to, to fit into the mold that it needs to fit into so that you can take advantage of automation. Every organization will, will experience some benefits. So we just saw the 100% thing. And even though there is a journey in front of you, it doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't, it doesn't have to take long. And it is great to do with a partner that can usher you through it. And let's talk about some use cases. First, we're going to talk about some AI use cases. And I'm going to do a little pivot here. And we've been talking a lot about automation and some influence of AI. But I want to, I want to talk about how AI really plugs in well into automation. There are three spots that I see that it works really well. S starting back in December, spe well, I spent a lot of time with experimentation along with some of my other engineering counterparts and our organization to really dig in and find out how we could take advantage of, uh, of what, what's out in the AI marketplace. Everybody here is aware of, of ChatGPT, OpenAI, um, Google Bard is out now. There's a lot of different tools out, out in the space. And I sat right here in this desk and I tried to figure out where we could use them, use them best, along with other people. And what we've seen is in data gathering and normalization, it's great. I'm actually going to take a quick pause here. This couch over here, um, when I was working on all this stuff, my daughter was down here. And I'm working on all these things and trying to figure out how to use AI. And what I see is all these recommendations that are com coming back from AI. I'm thinking to myself, it's all great to have this information. I have lots of information of things I should be doing. So I've got all this information of things I should be doing. AI tells me more things I should be doing. My daughter sitting over here is telling me all these things I should be doing. So she was over there making recommendations of what I should do with AI. And I, I, I had this little like visual of AI and my daughter are, are one and the same and they're both backseat drivers. I'm trying to figure out how to make this all work. So until we have an automation friendly solution that can take those inputs from AI and take them safely and do something tangible with them. They are just another thing that adds to the pile of things that we should do. So here are some really practical places where we think that we have found value in AI. Now data gathering and normalization. We've, we've, sometimes we have data sets that are just straight fields. Here's a, a you know, a brand and a, a product number and et cetera, et cetera. And, and what I see with AI is it's really good at taking and and forming 
great value, valuable sentences about the, the, the value of that product. So you may not have a description that's, that's human friendly and compelling. You might have just data inputs and AI is extremely good at that. It's extremely good at recognizing same types of things so that you can bucket them. Um, so for example, if there's inconsistency or misspellings with, with brands or products, it can do a great job with normalization there. And we have definitely seen that working safely. Uh, the uh, uh, second to that is uh, last mile of ad, develop of ad development. Ads have to feel like humans wrote them. We're talking to people. We're trying to express value to people. And with LLM, uh, the, the large language model AI that's out there, we can take data inputs and intention and turn that into phrasing that works really well. We'll talk about a couple spots in a couple slides from now. We're going to talk about how we use that in, in performance max and some of the performance max work that, that's been going on right now. But you can understand it for RSAs. We did this with a manual, a manual augmentation inside of our tool in a little thing called we call Muse, where we give people insights and information about what AI thinks are compelling ad content. And we've got some governance around that to make sure that it stays compliant, isn't, you know, you know, isn't inflammatory in any way. And you can just pick and click. So we think that we're exchanging um, writing for reviewing in those pla in those places. And then finally, we've done a lot of a lot of work in the performance data interpretation. So when there's a there's an account that is running data, part of our job is to express express the state of the account to our to our clients. Tell them how it's doing. Tell them the wins and losses that are in their account. AI has shown pretty good um, pretty good potential in that area as well. I have definitely seen its limitations. I've seen it do its phantom hallucinations, but with some governance around it, with some tooling around it, we have been able to wrangle it in and make it feel like it, it's, um, you know, make it make it more accurate each time. And that's a that's a piece that I think that you'd need to do to to take your hand off the wheel a little bit with AI right now is to to make sure you have that that last mile auditing. So we just talked about the last mile auditing. Active monitoring is super important. There are compliance things. You will get fined if you use AI and it makes the wrong decision because nobody cares that you used AI to get there. But if you, for example, I, we make this little joke here, Porsches don't like you to call them cheap. Uh, it doesn't matter how you put them in uh, in your ad, but if you put cheap or bargain or discount, they don't like that. It, it costs money. So if you're ever to do something like that, you'll be out of compliance and you will get penalized for it. If we let AI run autonomously, that may happen. So we have governance around that. Let AI do its suggestions. And if it comes back with any of those restricted words, make sure that those are scrubbed and pulled and, and, and pulled out. Um, so with that, having that governance sitting around it allows you to more safely use AI, gives you your compliance, your predictability, and your control that we all need in order to feel good about where it's going. So now I'm gonna talk about two specific uh, case studies that we have worked on that where automation has been core to chat to to accomplishing a goal that we could not otherwise accomplish. Fluency has 33 million ads in its portfolio running at any given point in time. That's a that's a big number and that's probably more than anybody cares to hear about. Of those 33 million, 28.9 had to go through the ETA to RSA conversion a couple of years ago. So this is this is a historic one. We, we are already through it. OpenAI was not available at the time. So what we had to do, so this is a pre-AI pre solution. What we had to do is make those conversions and make them con those conversions safely. Everybody knows that ETAs and RSAs are a different format. You have to control, uh, you have more headlines, but they're interchangeable. You can't have sequencing of headline one, two, and three, unless you pin. Like there's a lot of complexity in how you build those out. You're, your descriptions one and two don't just always sit there unless you pin them there. So you have to have these libraries of things that make sense to work together that Google can then stitch together. Um, so we pre AI, pre open AI and pre AI, we had to make libraries of these, these, this ad content, which is pretty safe, you know, but you make those libraries once with variables that are relevant to each account and the situation, put those in those decision rule engines that we have that says, you know, if we're going to, focus on the, you know, our financing rates, then these, this is the library that we want to use. So we have, we have these libraries of things that are relevant to each of the topics that we have, and then we can scale it out. And what that does, and this isn't quite the right number, this 334 days of effort, 
If you take 28 million ads, 28.9 million ads, and if you could update each ad, one ad per second, for every second of the day, 24-7, it would take 334 days to do that. Now, we all know that you could not, you, you couldn't even click the button once a second inside Google Ads to, to make that change. Nobody can work 24-7. Nobody wants to work, so nobody wants to work nearly that much, but a machine can. So with this ETA to RSA, we were able to test this in small batch, prove that the, the, that the transition wasn't going to damage performance, make some small adjustments, and then scale this out with literally zero labor. It took about a day to, to do all 28 million ads. Um, no worries there. A machine's really built for exactly that. So new libraries of, of content, migration has happened, and we have we have gigantic savings. Really what I would say here, so we use this 334 days as the most conservative number possible. I really think it would have been impossible to do 28.9 million ads with any number of people, maybe 28.9 million people. I don't know. Um, so the second, the second case study that I want to talk about is one that's currently ongoing right now. So we're in this exact same boat again. Google is transitioning all of our smart shopping campaigns to performance max campaigns. The performance max campaigns will auto migrate, but if you want to take control of that, and if you want to take advantage of some of the performance max benefits, like having asset groups that are relevant to each of your, your product filters, that's a bigger, bigger job. So we have 3,600, just as an example on vehicle ads, we have 3,600 vehicle ads that are being transitioned to performance max as we go. So we have used our automation platform to accomplish this. But with this really cool like new opportunity, AI does exist now in 2023. We do have the ability to use this to build our asset groups and to try to do that safely. So that library generation is not completely autonomous, but it is built from AI tools that will give suggestions that a user will, will approve or disapprove into the library. And then from there, now that we have the library, all of those things, all those same automation tasks become very simple. Um, we're in phase three of, of our rollout with our largest automotive client. That means the first two have gone smoothly. They're just doing it in blocks to make sure everything goes smoothly. It hasn't taken any uh, labor after this point. It's literally just click and say, I want these to migrate and, it, and it's ready to go. So as, as we've built those libraries out early and have done this transition, all things are going smooth. It looks, it looks really good. It's a very positive story. So let's talk about some action steps that you can take now. These are the key takeaways that I'd like you to have from, from our session here today. You, if you can properly align your AI use cases with your, with your strategy and goals, you'll be successful. It's not a one size fits all. I wouldn't want to, like I hear it all the time, we'll just use AI for and some very large um, audacious goal. I think it fits well in, in, in boxes. Find its use cases and then, and then set yourself up for it. Understand your, your existing operations, and that's a super important input to any automation that you want to do after that. So if you wanted, if you want to automate, you have to understand what the, your labor costs are today, where they spend their time, and what parts are, are well suited for automation. And then you want to focus your AI approach on, on all the things that you can control so that you can scale them. Um, we talked about those three spots, the data gathering, the content variations, and and your performance recommendations back to your clients, super important and super good places for us to, to just explore. So I think you can enjoy the journey. Automation is fun. When you're done with it, you will smile, I guarantee it. And um, thank you so much. If there's any way I can help, reach on out. Thank you for watching. Click the agenda link at the top of your screen to choose your next session.